Okay, so we've defined our block dimensions here. Then we're going to create our brick and get the ID of that brick, which is probably going to be 1. There we go. There's our block. And then we're going to move it down. Uh, we're going to move it by half the block height plus 10 kilometers. And the reason for that is because if we moved it all the way down, then uh, we want it to extend slightly above topography because we're going to end up chopping that whole block with topography. So we want to make sure it's sticking up above that. So here we go. Okay. So we've moved our block. Then we're going to start bringing in our surfaces that we created before. First, let's bring in the topography. Okay, so here, now you can see why we, uh, why we didn't move it all the way down to uh, z equals zero, and that's so we can chop the top of it off with this surface. Okay, we'll bring in those other two. You'll also notice that, we, um, that the surfaces that we created extend beyond the boundaries of our block. You want that so that you'll be able to completely chop through the block with these surfaces. So there's everything that we brought in. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to chop the top off of our block with the topography, and then we're going to delete that top because that we don't want that. And then we're going to actually, this body too, that's the actual uh, topography surface. We don't need it anymore since we've used it to cut the top of the block. So first we'll... And these web cut operations, the more complicated your surface, the longer it's going to take to do. So this is a pretty simple surface and it's still taking a little while. But there we go. So now we have the block below and the block above. And now we're just going to delete that one above. There we go. And now that we don't need it anymore, we'll go ahead and delete that surface. There we go. So now we have our uh, block with the two faults. Okay, so the next thing is to chop the remaining block with our uh, subduction inter interface, and then we'll delete uh, the subduction interface. Again, it'll take a little while. Okay, so now we have this, this block, that's our subducting slab, and this will be our overriding plate. But now we want to divide that with the splay fault. So the, uh, this will divide it into a part that we figure is like sediments, and then the other part will be the, the remainder of the plate. Okay, so now we've got, this is all of our geometry right here. We have our subducting slab, our sediments, and our overriding plate. So that's, um, oh, then the last thing, I don't believe we've talked about this, imprinting and merging. In trellis, imprinting is essentially letting trellis know when two objects are adjacent to each other. And so it, it makes it aware of that. And then merging is when it finds coincident uh, edges or surfaces and merges those together. So you pretty much always want to do this so that you don't end up with interior uh, surfaces that you don't want. So we're going to imprint all 
we, uh, all volumes with all volumes, and then we're going to merge everything. And that can take a little while as well. OK, so that's our geometry. What it did when we did that, it merged three surfaces together. So it would have been this, uh, let's see, this surface, that surface, and then this surface down here. OK, so now that we've done that, we can start making our mesh. Now, the other thing that we didn't do here, it's also uh, possible to export the entire geometry because a lot of times you're going to want to have the same geometry and mesh it different ways. So uh, you can save it as either an Exodus file or, or just a qubit file, which I have found actually is faster. So you can do that just from, you can do a save as, or you can do an export, which would be if you're going to export like an Exodus file. And then that saves all your geometry, so you don't have to go through the whole process of doing all the web cutting, all of the imprinting and merging. And for complicated geometries, that can be a huge saving. So that's probably one that we should put in here, but uh, maybe for next time. Anyway, so since we've already done the geometry, we won't do that again. So we're just going to make a very simple mesh, uh, six kilometers uh, uniform resolution. So that's what we're doing here. We're going to use tetrahedra to uh, mesh this thing. So in this case, you can just tell it to mesh, mesh the volume straight away. But in many cases, it's better to first mesh the surfaces and make sure that they're all OK, that the triangles on the surfaces are good. So in some cases, you would mesh the surfaces examine the element quality on the surfaces, smooth them if necessary, and then go ahead with your volume meshing. So we're, we've broken this into two parts here, but we're not going to bother with the smoothing part. So here we're setting our schemes. And here, first we'll mesh the surfaces. OK, so there, that's the uh, surface mesh that we've created. And it looks OK. So we'll go ahead and mesh the volumes. OK, so now we've meshed our volume. We can, what we might do, I'll just look really quickly. We'll look at our element quality. I will say that probably wouldn't, we wouldn't expect ideal quality because we have some kind of sharp edges here at where these things intersect the surface. And we have uniform resolution of six kilometers. So it might make it more difficult to get uh, good quality, but we'll just see. So that's so-so. You would like, ideally, you would like to have everything uh, condition number less than two. We don't have that, so, and you can see that they're, the bad ones are along, along the edge there where the uh, subduction interface intersects the surface. So the first thing we can do, there's the cleanup command, which kind of looks for bad quality elements and remeshes that. And then, so you can do that, and then we can do our smoothing where we're setting the uh, condition number and the amount of CPU time that we're going to spend doing it. So first, we'll clean up the volumes. OK, let's see if that changed anything. Not so much. Yeah. With uh, 
kind of coarse resolution mesh right now, uh, Trellis doesn't really have a lot of freedom with what it can do, so we may not improve things very much. Okay, so it didn't, I don't think it really improved things at all, but okay, may, it might have reduced the number of bad elements. So I think in the interest of time, I'm not really going to mess with the boundary conditions because that's pretty standard that we, same sort of thing we've done before. We just have uh, three blocks. We have our fault. Ah, okay, there's one part here. Um, this is um, something that we meant to change and did not. This is from a previous version of Pilot where when you have intersecting faults, what we did is just remove the intersection. Now they can intersect, but we still have to mark that place. So what we should do rather than removing this group is we should mark it as an edge. And I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to do that but that would be an exercise for people during tinker time, perhaps. So I'm going to go ahead, where's my mesh, and just do that. Okay. Okay, so we can just look at our blocks, plate, slab, sediments, our node sets. We have the, our regular external boundaries. We have that, um, yeah, x neg no fault, y pos no, yeah, so that. Then we have our subduction fault and our splay fault. And then finally, we go ahead and export our mesh. Okay. So, any questions about that while I start going to the next uh, example? Yes. Well, we, now we, we haven't actually set up a problem with this one, but you, yeah, you could set that up. Uh, this one, we don't have the, like the bottom of the slab, but if you're interested, you could put one in. And then we also, you'll notice that we had plus and minus y's that did, that uh, node sets that excluded the fault. And the reason for that is because you can't put constraints on a fault node. So if you were applying your boundary conditions, like you might have like just roller boundary conditions on those faces, and you could still apply uh, your boundary conditions on the fault. So yeah, for one like this, like what you would probably do, you might have velocity boundary conditions on the plus and minus x faces, rollers on, and rollers on the, the y sides and then on the bottom. And then you could either have some, you could have frictional properties on the fault might be one way to go. If you were doing that, you would actually extend your boundaries much further out. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. What's that? The, well, sometimes that happens, yeah. There's, I believe, um, in the next example, we'll show one strategy for uh, what we did is just all at once tried to uh, reduce the condition number. In many cases, it's better to do it gradually to like, to not try and go all the way from a high condition number down to a low one, but do it in steps. And so what we do is we, we make a loop where we reduce your target condition number each step, and sometimes you can get a better result that way. There's also a, a remesh command, which you can use. But you have to be careful with that, because I've noticed uh, sometimes when you use remesh, uh, a, 
what starts out as a reasonably sized mesh will rapidly explode into a humongous mesh. Yeah, so, yes. Well, you could um, translate it. Uh, Pilot has its own mesh format, an ASCII format, which is very simple. Uh, it's described in the manual. If you you could write probably a translate, is it like ASCII type format or? Yeah, it can be ASCII. I mean, we designed that format primarily for uh, demonstration purposes, but you, you could run a real problem that way if you wanted to. If you, you, you could uh, have a mesh that you created some other way, translate it into that, and then, um, or, or, or make it into a NetCDF uh, file, which is, um, yeah, so that would be more compact. And uh, you could actually, yeah, you could do that with Python or whatever language you like, we're, we're biased. Um, so our next, um, okay. Our next example is how we uh, use the trellis sizing function to create nicely graded meshes. So the first thing we're gonna do is just create very, uniform uh, stupid mesh, but then we're going to, let me change my directory. So this is a, a real simple mesh, it's just a, a box really, and we're going to mesh it up first, uniform resolution. So I'll go ahead and, uh, geometry is quite simple, so I'm not going to bother with that. So here's our geometry. It's just two sides. This would be a fault, and then this might be like the mantle. And so we're going to just mesh that at uniform resolution of four kilometers, tetrahedral mesh. Oh, I haven't meshed it. I just set the size. Uh, again, we're first going to mesh the surfaces and then the volumes. Okay, so you see we have a fairly coarse mesh. Uh, you wouldn't generally like a mesh like this for doing any calculations on because usually when you're creating a mesh, you want high resolution where things are going on and then coarse resolution around the edges. So, oh, uh, we're going to export the Exodus file, which as I mentioned is netcdf. This command here there's actually two different Exodus formats. One is for what they call large files, and I don't know if it makes much difference, but our scripts are set up to read a particular format, so we're telling uh, Exodus to use that format. So we're turning off the large Exodus uh, option. Oh, we create one block. It makes it easier for doing the sizing function information. Otherwise, it has to go through it block by block when you bring it back in and then we'll just export it. So there's that. 